17th day of April 2024. Good evening on this wonderful Wednesday and welcome to the Daily Report. My name is George Marenga, still holding the fort for Hibak Said. The wonderful Roda Nyamai is on Sen language interpretation tonight. Now, on the marketplace, my guest is none other than Principal Secretary in the State Department for Micro, Small, um, Medium Enterprises, that is MSMEs. It is a new docket that was introduced in this administration. And of course, it is one of the pillars that the Kenya Kwanzaa government campaigned on, especially for the uh, administration, rather, to take over the reins in this. Uh, administration of the Kenya Kwanzaa government. And talking about the PS, that is Susan Mangeni, the Honorable Susan Mangeni. She's already here in the studio. Madam PS, welcome to our studios. And thank you, thank you for George. gracing our screens tonight. Thank you. Brilliant. So this docket was introduced in this new administration. Yep. Apart from the promises that you know the Kenya Kwanzaa government campaigned on, when you look at its efficacy, is it fulfilling its TORs with you spearheading that docket? Yeah, we are fulfilling our TORs ah. because we are part of the promise. And uh, um, it goes uh, to the records that this is the first time mm -hmm. that you are having an administrative uh, framework uh, and rather institutional mechanism mm -hmm. focusing on the growth of MSME. And the reason why we're doing this is because if you look at our economy, mm -hmm. the 98% of all our businesses in this country fall under yeah, MSME. MSME. Only 2% are in the larger enterprises, enterprises. Uh, bracket. Yeah. So, but again, mm -hmm. MSMEs uh, play a big role. Mm -hmm. Their contribution to uh, our GDP almost at 40%. Mm -hmm. They also, most of the jobs are in the MSME sector. Okay. So therefore, this is one sector that has great potential right. of uh, helping us to grow our economy, to yes. create jobs, and also to enhance the livelihood of our people. So when you look at how you've supported businesses on yes. a scale of one to 10 or one to 100 your percentage, how do you think you're supporting them? Have you feared about Yeah, I think, I think we are on course because- uh, What's the um, score you'd rate yourself with? I would say we are at, um, around 70 percent but it's a journey uh -huh. it's a journey uh -huh. we, we are still on course uh -huh. we've been working on the preliminaries creating uh -huh. a conducive environment in okay. terms of policy mm -hmm. creating an environment where also we can coordinate all efforts oh, okay. towards the msme right. focus across the uh -huh. sector uh -huh. development partners private sectors uh, government agencies so that everybody can put their hands on deck really? to be able to support MSME to grow and to help us rebuild uh, our economy. So we shall be looking at how the 70% has been it's and okay. what we need to do yeah. to <laughs> accomplish the 30 to get to 100%. That is a PS Susan Mangeni, Principal Secretary for MSME Development. That conversation on the marketplace will be coming your way in just a short while right here on TV47, the home of untold stories. Of course, you can trust right here on TV47 to bring you guests who are policymakers involved, of course, in various sectors in this country country, including MSME. Channel your feedback at TV47 News on X formerly Twitter or at on Susan Mangeni, that is her X profile. You can send your feedback as well. 22047 is our SMS line. We are open. We'll also be opening our telephone lines for you to call in live and ask your questions or send your feedback as well. But first, the highlights. Tonight, Interior CS warns Kenyans living in low-lying areas of 16 counties of possible emergency evacuation after some of the seven Fawkes dams, chief among them the Masinga Dam, broke banks, spilling unbelievable amounts of water downstream. Frustration galore. As the wage bill conference winds up, just why are the brilliant government policies not implemented? And what of the thousands of public servants in office, courtesy of fake certificates? Those who have earned money using fake certificates should refund us our public money. Is indeed, is indeed equivalent to obtaining by false pretense or something? 
And those who are in government offices today with fake certificates, they should leave. Plus, a tale out of a police drama series, a police chase, a wild chopper ride, a triumphant arrest, and the confusing release afterwards. Find out the latest in the saga involving ESCC and Muranga's ex-governor Mwangi Wairia and Ko. We thank you for choosing TV 47 to inform you. Let's get the show on the road, shall we? And the wife of former Moranga Governor Mwangi Wairia, that is Jane Waigwe Kimani, and her brother Solomon Mutura Kimani, who were this morning arrested of alleged graft, have been set free by a Milimani law court. The chief magistrate ruled that Wairia and the co accused in the multi million tender scandal had earlier sought an anticipatory order. Order, barring their prosecution. Lennox Sangre now reports. Ali Wednesday and embattled former Muranga Governor Mwangi Wairia's wife Jane Waige Kimani was a woman under siege. Jane, flanked by her brother Solomon Mutura, were briefly under arrest by the anti corruption officials. The the two are prime suspects in the scandal by the way of being directors of one of the companies allegedly used as the conduit for a scheme to defraud Muranga County government 140 million in the year 2015-2016. According to the anti-graft body, the eight are to be arrested for procurement fraud in a case where Iria allegedly awarded a public tender to a company associated with his wife and relatives. The figure pale manake order ya mahakama ilitoka siku ya jana. And therefore the court order became effective from the time it was issued. And we communicated to the media houses, we communicated to the, uh, to the ESCC and the ODPP and we informed them that we have a court order staying the implementation of the decision dated 13th of April 2024, which is a decision that arose from the DPP's office, suggesting that the, uh, my clients should be charged before a court of law. Attempts to charge the duo were thwarted by the courts after Iria's lead counsel, Ndegwanjiru, literally landed in Muranga to pick up an injunction from a Muranga law courts barring ESCC and ODPP from arresting and prosecuting Wairia and his co-accused. I'm actually wondering whether this court has a matter before it. Yes. Noting that these orders were issued last evening at four, uh, around between 3 to 4 p.m. Milimani anti-corruption magistrate Thomas Nzuki released the two unconditionally with the mention of the case coming up on 29th of April. And as well as the, the decision of the DPP to charge all the accused persons stands state pending the outcome of the two matters which are in the High Court at Murang, a petition and a miscellaneous application. These are some of the steps taken by the ESEC to tame corruption. Now it's a matter of wait and see if these steps will yield fruits. Lennox Sengre, TV 47, Nairobi. Thank you, Lennox, for that. The President has instructed the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, ESCC, plus the Directorate of Criminal Investigations, DCI, to go after 2,100 people in the public service using fake certificates. These directives come at a time when the government is looking to have a clean-up of the public service whose wage bill in the financial year 2022-2023 accounts for 40% of revenue. Sheila Chelangat tells us more. An audit done indicated that over 2,100 people are working in public service courtesy of fake papers. Those who have and money using fake certificates should refund us our public money. Is indeed, is indeed equivalent to obtaining by false pretense or something? And those who are in government offices today with fake certificates, 
they should leave. ESCC and the DCI have been directed to spearhead recovery of the resources lost from this fraudulent activity. Those who have fake certificates working for government at any level, please surrender and walk away. Because it will not be business as usual as we go into the future. So, what we are ever on the work in the Tafuta. I said, my son, I said, 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 I and characters with fake certificates, probably we could knock 10,000 people from the wage bill and recover a billion or two. Meanwhile, the president also maintained that Kenya should stop living beyond its means, calling for a paradigm shift in the management of public service. I believe that we can raise an extra 500 billion, if not an extra trillion, just by digitizing the Kenya Revenue Authority and getting money that currently we are not getting. So if we must continue to recruit, and yet we have a wage bill issue, then we've got to do something around how we are managing the staff establishments that we have today. As various departments embark on implementations of resolutions from this conference, they have been challenged to ensure accountability if the wage bill revenue ratio of 35% is to be met by 2028. Sheila Chelangat for TV47 at the Bombers of Kenya in Nairobi. Thank you, Sheila, for that. Today, Parliament has up upheld the rejection of President William Ruto's nominee for the ambassador to the Democratic Republic of Congo, John Gedinji Kero, while approving 25 out of the 27 nominees vetted by the National Assembly's Defence and Foreign Relations Committee. These on a day claims emerged of behind the scenes arm twisting by people said to be influential businessmen to have the committee approve Gedinji as Consular General to DRC Congo. Apollo Kamau reports. Hi, Charles Gedinji Kero. Members of the National Assembly sealed the fate of President William Ruto's nominee for Consul General to the Democratic Republic of Congo, Charles Gedenji, after he was found unfit to serve with the National Assembly's Defense and Foreign Relations Committee, concluding that Gedenji lacked the knowledge of his area of jurisdiction. As members of that opinion say, I... I the House approved 25 out of the 27 nominees after another nominee, former West Mogirango MP Vincent Kemosi, declined his nomination as an envoy to Ghana. Mr. Charles Gidinji Kairu demonstrated a glaring lack of knowledge on the position of Council General and the station to which he was nominated to serve. As such, the nominee does not possess the requisite abilities, qualities, knowledge, and experience thus unsuitable for appointment as Council General to Goma DRC. Diplomatic appointments are very important because they are the face of Kenyans out there. Most times people have not known who we are and the person we post there reflects who then we are. So when we reject a person, it's, it's more serious than even just appointing someone to serve within the country. Evangie's rejection was no walk in the park as revelations emerged of behind the scenes arm twisting by influential people who wanted Gedenji approved for his diplomatic post. And I know they have been lobbying people on the basis of their ethnicities, on the basis of where they come from, and even at times enticing members with their incentives. And Honorable Speaker, this would be the most shameful thing that we can do as a house. A section of MPs have a laughed off Gedenji's nomination, which prompted the Defense and Foreign Relations Committee's resolution, which was also approved by the House, that all consul generals undergo vetting, while those appointed without the House approval be vetted again. That is the hustler 
that President Ruto promised. So carry your burden. We are here. We want to support you. The ambassadorial nominee's list was also faulted by MPs who said it failed the ethnic balance test. Apul Kamau, TV47. We are due short for a short break right here on the Daily Report. We thank you for staying with us. I see some feedback right here on our WhatsApp number. Hi, it's Wangoi from Kikuyu, watching, loving the show so much. Thank you so much, Wangoi, uh, for your feedback. Keep your feedback coming. Remember, tonight we speak to P.S. Susan Mangeni, Principal Secretary for Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises Development. That live interview coming your way in a short while, but first, well, let's take this short break. You're back in a few minutes. Do stay with us. katika mfahamu kiongozi tutakuletea viongozi aina mbalimbali mbali. nilikuwa na nisani kama kumi mm -hmm. na pia nilikuwa nimenua minibus minibus niko niwa mm. kushinda unaangalia simu ya mzee soma biblia ama ingia kwa washroom kujisuka <coughs> eh, mpaka nimeletoa <laughs> hivi i don't know whether any of my children would want to get into the political field sijajua bado kila alhamisi saa moja nusu kuendelea Welcome back and thank you for staying with us. We're watching the Daily Report as well as the Marketplace that will be coming your way in a short while with P.S. Susan Mangeni, Principal Secretary for MSME Development. Now, the Speaker for, of the National Assembly, Moses Utangula, has warned disciplinary action against members of Parliament speaking against the soon-to-be-opened Bunge Towers. Speaker Wetangula stated the MPs might find themselves before for the Powers and Privileges Committee for speaking against the project without having sufficient information. His statement coming after Nandi Senator Samson Cherarge poked holes in the information about towers, which is expected to be officially opened on Friday this week. Our senior parliamentary reporter Elizabeth Mutuku with the details. Just one day to the long-awaited official opening of the Bunge Tower, rumbles have emerged over the multi-billion shillings tower, which is expected to house 349 MPs plus their staffers. The murmurs over the state of the building have forced the Speaker of the National Assembly, Moses Masika Wetangula, and who is also the Chair of the Parliamentary Service Commission, PSC, to issue stern warning over what he terms as inaccurate and vitriolic allegations concerning the tower. The members who are raising concerns, like I had one saying the lifts are not working, there are six high-speed lifts, six or five, all working as efficiently as any building you can find in Manhattan in the U.S. During Wednesday afternoon parliamentary session, Speaker Wetangula communicated to the House that the President would officially open the tower on Friday, further making an effort to allay any fears that the building is not ready for use. The Speaker also appeared to persuade members to ignore what he called rejectionist philosophers as he further responded to concerns by the minority leader on the negative publicity the opening of the building has generated. Let's not just those rejection is philosophers who will always say can anything good come from Nazareth honorable speaker how do we assuage the public how do we address these concerns that are coming from the public about the efficacy the efficacy of the Bunge Tower project 
earlier Nandi Senator Samson Cherarugi had demanded the postponement of the opening of the house until key concerns are addressed. Even if you occupy them without lifts up to the 25th floor, it would be a work in progress because then it will cost those who ought to do that to do it immediately. Zile ofisi ambazo mapatikana hapo kama bunge la Senate limepewa karibu hamsini na kitu. So kwanza ilo jengo alitoshelezi maitaji ya ofisi. Hata sekretari yetu wataendelea kufanya kazi katika corridors. The construction of the building started 2010 with initial budget of 5.89 billion shillings, later revised to 7.1 billion shillings before being pushed to 9.6 billion shillings. Even as President William Ruto is set to commission Bunge Tower on Friday, many questions remain unresolved with some MPs insisting that they will not be occupying their offices in the tower. Elizabeth Mutuko, TV47, Nairobi. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that, and we wait to see how it all plays out. Deputy President Rigadi Gashagwa has criticized government officials and agencies of a poor implementation of government policies and strategies. These as development partners call for accountability to donor funding that the state receives. The accidental admission by the second in command revealing that too many and too expensive board meetings have yielded little, especially for the common monarchy putting into question strategies put in place by the Kenya Kwanzaa government. Moege William reports. I wish to invite... Wednesday, Deputy President Rigadi Gashagwa spearheaded a meeting between the government and various development partners led by the United Nations to highlight achievements attained in the year 2022-2023 with an outlook of the current year. Gashagwa was quick to admit but call out government officials in what he termed as too much boardroom and retreat meetings with less implementation at the expense of taxpayers' money. There has been concern that we are having too many meetings. We are talking too much, which is also good to talk. But it's the time now to apply resources to the real interventions out there in the field. United Nations resident coordinator Stephen Jackson pointing out that with the global body planning to implement a 285 billion shillings framework between the year 2022 to 2026, there is need for an audit of the implementation projects undertaken in collaboration with the Kenyan government. Let's not do any more workshops in Naivasha or Mombasa. They're lovely parts of the country, uh, but let's use the money for other things. And uh, you have some very powerful support from other uh, bilateral partners on this too. We all think that the, it is too urgent. Uh, we need to be meeting here in Nairobi. There are plenty of good places to do it. The call to action by Deputy President speaking volume on government strategies in alleviating one oriented issues as is the purpose of the funds. Case in point, mitigating effects of the El Nino as witnessed in 2023, where more than 150 people were reported dead and hundreds of families left homeless despite millions of money set aside for the emergency. I had just come into office during this very difficult time and you held my heart and showed me around because I had just come from the bush, I, I didn't know how to go around the space. Parts of the country continue to record heavy downpour with floods wreaking havoc and in extreme cases leading to death. Still, this putting into question the government readiness to handle such emergencies despite heavy funding from development partners. Mugi William, TV47. Thank you, Moige, for that. Embattled Health Cabinet Secretary Susan Nakumecha, while appearing before Parliament, highlighted the contentious issue of medical interns' payment, clarifying that there will be no reduction of payment for the interns who have been at work and that the reduction will only apply to the interns being absorbed currently. The CS has insisted that the medics will receive a stipend of 70,000 Kenya shillings Kenya shillings, a figure fiercely opposed by the Medics Union, and Odida, with more in the following report. Europa. Gloria. 
Order, Senators. This was the scene at the Senate after a question and answer session of the embattled health cabinet secretary Susan Nakumicha over issues bedeviling the health sector. The matter of reference being the more than month long doctor strike that has paralyzed activities in hospitals. Temperatures rose further after Nairobi Senator Edwin Sifuna told off the legislators for asking vague questions. The health CS had appeared before Parliament in the afternoon to respond to matters including the delays in posting medical interns absorption of universal health coverage contract staff and failure by the government to recognize the collective bargaining agreement signed with the doctors in 2017, key factors that are being contested by the medical personnel. Addressing the implementation of 2017 CBA, which has been the center of dispute, the government through the ministry has distanced itself from its implementation. According to the health CS, the matter should be handled at the county level. A collective bargaining agreement is a document signed between an employer and an employee. The ones that I spoke about, the CBA progress that has been made by the national government is for those employees who are for national government. And therefore, I can authoritatively say that as the national government, we have managed to implement some of the uh, things asked for in the CBA. You have leaders who it is in their place, including governors, saying we support the, the doctor's strike. Really? If you support the doctor's strike, pay. Pay the money they're asking for. On the issue of payment of medical interns, it has been revealed that according to recommendation by the Salaries and Remuneration Commission, it can only be stipends amounting to 70,000 Kenyan shillings and not in any way a remuneration. We were directed and guided by SRC. And from the guideline, they said it cannot be a remuneration it can only be a stipend. The Employment and Labor Relations Court, the court through Judge Baira Mongaya, says the union members and medics should not be subjected to any form of threats or intimidation. The court has ordered for what is called the whole of the nation approach meeting to be convened without conditions and should be concluded not later than Friday the 19th of April. The court has extended the interim orders, which will be concluded in 30 days. An Odida, TV 47. Thank you, Anne, for that. The government will, in the next three months, embark on an ambitious plan to curb road accidents in the country. President William Ruto has directed Roads Cabinet Secretary Kipchumba Murkomen to introduce new measures, among them instant fines to those abusing traffic laws. A similar attempt was initiated eight years ago where offenders paid instant fines using mobile money. Kisewa Emory with the details. In the last four months, at least 1,500 people have lost their lives in road accidents across the country. This stark state of affairs, Kenyans calling on government agencies, given the responsibility to ensure road safety, to take action and stop the menace. The government recently reintroducing the National Transport and Safety Authority patrols in a bid to ensure road users are not breaking the law. President William Ruto has now publicly responded to various concerns on the issue, tasking his cabinet secretary, Kipchumba Murkomen, to put in place tougher measures, such as an instant road fine, if that is what it takes, to stop road carnage. We have discussed, we have, to, we have talked about instant fines for a very long time. Waziri, please, instant fines, 90 days is too much time for you to wait. Let's do it. The objective is to reduce road accidents by half. We must be focused on results. We must be focused on results. And the results will be the numbers to come down. The target, as was said by the chair, is to cut down by 50%. The Cabinet Secretary Kipchumba Murkomen spoke passionately about the need to reduce road accidents that continue to devastate families and the national economy. The statistics are very, very, very uh, uh, grim and actually very telling of the very terrible behavior we have as citizens of this country. To be losing between 4,000 
to 4,600. The highest was 2022, uh, 4,600. And if we had gone at this rate in this year, perhaps we were going to surpass that number. Last year, 4,200 people passed away as a result of road accidents with 20,000 critically injured. The matter has attracted the attention of the National Assembly with MPs agreeing in principle that action needs to be taken but disagreeing over how that action will be taken. This organization known as NTSA is sleeping. I think NTSA is sleeping because even the Minister for Roads is also sleeping. The Cabinet Secretary for Roads is simply a noisemaker all over the place, making noise on Twitter, making noise on Facebook and everywhere and showing, showing us how he's living a good life. Mulete mofisa ambao ni wazuri wataka barabarani kwa kisha kuamba wanasimamisha gari na kumshitaki dereva kwa haki. Siku mshitaki tu kwa sababu wamekuja wataka shingi miambili, hamekuambia hana unamshitaki. NTSA has been running a nationwide campaign dubbed Usalama Barabarani aimed at reducing road accidents in the country. Kisawa Emory, TV47. Thank you, Emery, for that. Security experts have criticized the government's approach in dealing with the banditry in the North Rift region. The security operators advise that the state borrowed a leaf from the security policies and reforms in other countries with a similar issue in order to address the situation comprehensively. Ruga Eval with the details. After President William Ruto announced the security enhancement in Lake Kipia County is by 70%. Habari niko nayo ni kwamba mambo ya usalama hapa imeshughulikiwa karibu asilimia sabini temanini. Experts in the security sector have raised concerns about the president's decision to deploy more military officers in areas that are prone to attacks by bandits. While suggesting that the government should consider alternative policies, the observers reveal that current strategies have been in place for a century without much success and need a refresh. The whole concept of tribalism, so to speak, is neutral in and of itself. Mm. That I don't need to be coming here, George, and I say, oh, I don't like him just the fact, by the fact that he comes from this and that other tribe. Yes. Other places or other... Speaking in Laikipia County, the president announced the procurement of additional ammunition explaining that this more will greatly enhance security measures. In the world we have but only two powers. Okay. We have the power of the sword and the power of the mind. Mm -hmm. And in the long run, it's always the power of the mind that wins mm -hmm. over the power of the sword. Mm -hmm. We've been trying to use the sword in dealing with banditry in North, Northern, North Rift, Kenya for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, from history, uh, I remember the first military operation that was conducted in those areas was in 1908. Not even in independent Kenya, mm -hmm. but the colonialists. They did an operation trying to... On the other hand, security analyst George Msamali suggests that it is time to eliminate the recurring incidents of banditry attacks. Tumeweka mpango ya karibu billion ishirini na tano. Kununua equipment mpya ya polisi wetu na walinda usalama. I thought devolution was going to cure uh, this marginalization. But surprisingly enough, with the devolution, now banditry has gone to another level. I believe what we are facing in North Rift needs a political and social economic solution, not the sword. Mm. Unless we look at it that way, we are not going to get an answer to this mm. problem. Ruga Ival, TV47. Thank you, Riga, for that story that leads us to another short break right here on The Daily Report. Remember, we still have PS Susan Mangeni, that is Principal Secretary for MSME Development in the country. Of course, this docket, as you'll remember, came in with the President William Ruto's administration. Keep your questions and feedback coming. We are back in a few minutes with more stories, of course, as well as that important conversation on the marketplace. Do stay with us. katika mfahamu kiongozi tutakuletea viongozi aina mbalimbali mbali. ni 
nilikuwa na nisani kama kumi na pia nilikuwa nimenua mini bus. Mini bus ni konua. Kushinda unaangalia simu ya mzee. Soma Biblia ama ingia kwa washroom ujisugue mpaka nimeletoa hii. I don't know whether any of my children would want to get into the political field. Sijajua bado. Kila alhamisi pamoja nusu kuendelea. Welcome back. Let's get sporty. The second leg of the 2023-2024 season of the Mashemeji Derby will be the main event in round 27 of the FKF Premier League fixtures as league leaders Gormahia prepare to host arc rivals AFC Leopards on this Sunday at Nyayo Stadium. Kogala will be looking to replicate their initial encounter of the season, which they secured a 2-0 victory over Leopards at Kasarani Stadium, claiming the the early bragging rights. Kogalo also came into the derby currently at the summit of the league standings with 54 points while AFC Leopards on the other hand are currently placed eighth with 38 points. However, AFC Leopards have been enjoying a good run of form in the last six matches, winning three, drawing two and losing only one. we're edging towards that objective of trying to retain the championship. So this weekend's another big opportunity for us to you know, move towards that. It's obviously a big game as well. Um, but first and foremost for us, it's three points um, and another three points to try and winning this championship. But we know it's going to be a big game. It's going to be a big attendance at Nio Stadium. And we're looking to put on a performance for our supporters. And if we can do that, I'm very confident we can pick up the three points. We respect every team in that way. Um, and for us, really, it's about playing to our standards, to our best, because we know we've got players, we've got a lot of match winners in the team. We've obviously got the best defensive record in the league. So if both in defence and in attack, if, if we play the way we know we can play, then three points aren't too far away. So, you know, for us, we respect our opponents. Um, they have some dangerous players as well. We'll make sure we let the players know about that. We'll make sure we pick up those small points. But really, 80% of the weekend is about how we play. If we play to our top level, I don't think there's any team in the league can compete with us. Yeah, look, everybody is uh, prepared. The mood is good. It's always the is motivation by itself. You don't need to motivate players too much for this game. I agree with you. It's a big one. It's uh, not only a big one in Kenya, it's a big one in Africa. So for me it's the first time. So yes, it's a, it's a, it's about tactical preparation, physical preparation, mental preparation. Uh, we, we, we take it as the challenge. Look, they are they are the reigning champions. They are they are leading the look. So for us it's the is the is the is the challenge to to succeed and to maybe to prepare something for for them and. Uh, Derby never has the favorite team. There is no uh, underdog or favorite team. So it's the it's the always 50-50, 11 v 11. It's a fight. It's a big game. So we need to be ready, and they will be also ready. And let's see. Safaricom has today announced a 4.3 million Kenya shillings sponsorship to the fifth edition of the Eldred City Marathon that is scheduled to take place on April 21st, 2024 in Eldred, Wasingishu County. The marathon has attracted top talents such as Victor Kipchurchir, who has won the race twice before in 2021 and 2022 and is once again on the lineup to beat his personal best time of 2 hours, 13 minutes and 10 seconds. The marathon will have two categories, 42 kilometers for both men and women and the 10 kilometer fun run. Naongea na kifua mbele ya kwamba pesa pesa ya wanariadha wako hatutasikia hizo mastori ya kusema pesa imechelewa. So tunashukuru sana serikali yetu ku and we are going to support initiatives that go towards uh, ensuring that our environment is clean and is good for a healthy nation. We are also going to adopt some athletes uh, so that they are able to be registered to participate in this event. And by doing like that, uh, Top Hill Hospital will have um, supported
Kenyan side Equity Bank earlier today suffered a three sets to nil defeat against Fools Rabat in the ongoing 45th African Volleyball Club Championship. The bankers, who had drawn motivation from their Tuesday 3 nil victory of a volley club green team from the Democratic Republic of Congo, today found themselves trailing in the third quarter after trailing 22 25 and 15 25 in the first and second set before wrapping their loss with a 16 to 25. Five points. If the team needs to have confidence that there is always someone on the ground that is going to take care of them so that uh, they go all in because otherwise they will restrain to avoid injuries. So that confidence makes the team, it, 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 it does something to their mentality so that uh, they are able to perform on the court. With 100 days to go to the highly anticipated Paris 2024 Olympic Games, Team Kenya athletes have intensified their preparations. The team recently participated in a workshop aimed at equipping them with essential professional and life skills. The athletes received training covering key areas such as financial management, personal branding, content creation and anti-doping awareness. Facilitated by industry experts, these sessions provided athletes with practical tools and knowledge to eff effectively navigate both their sporting careers and personal lives. To you, our athletes who represent us, and particularly on the topic of financial management. Uh, you know, we are committed to supporting you, supporting you financially with resources, but also with knowledge. And so we are available if you want to talk about how can you get more help in terms of financial management? Is the advice you're getting right? And, you know, how can we assist just to hold your hand even as you think about life after, after retirement? It is exactly 44 minutes past the hour. We thank you for watching The Daily Report. As promised, the marketplace is up next. And my guest tonight is none other than Susan Mangeni, Principal Secretary, Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises, MSME Development. Our sign language interpreter has been Rhoda Nyamai. She wishes you a wonderful night, even as you embark on this important conversation with Madam P.S. Karibusana. And welcome for rather and thank Thank you for staying with us. Asante. Brilliant. So yeah. you gave a score of 70% yeah. earlier on. Mm -hmm. When you look at, you know, the... And still going. And still going. <laughs> yeah. When you look at the support of businesses, especially manufacturing, mm -hmm. we have seen that due to the economic times that the country has been through, mm -hmm. quite a number of big companies have been, one, downsizing, mm -hmm. two, reinventing their business models. Mm -hmm. In the wake of post-COVID, the current economic mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. the depreciation of the Kenya mm -hmm. shilling and you know, how we saw it behave against the dollar, mm -hmm. do you think it inspires confidence in the Kenyan population to still venture into MSMEs? Yeah, uh, so it's very true. Uh, we faced uh, um, very challenging times and not just Kenya alone. This has been global challenge. It's been all over the world, especially when COVID hit. In fact, it hit other parts of this world mm. heavier than it even hit us. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, since then, every, every government has been, uh, and every economy has been on recovery path. And uh, as we've been recovering, there have been other initiatives, uh, for example, to support our MSMEs. We've had uh, initiatives to support recovery, for example, through credit guarantee scheme. Mm -hmm. I know for sure in Kenya, we've had initiative uh, supported through EU mm -hmm. and uh, supporting our financial institution to advance some credit to our MSMEs, especially the medium enterprises level to recover from mm -hmm. the shocks. I know for us as a government, we have a very robust credit guarantee scheme mm -hmm. of about uh, four, right now it's grown up to about six billion. Mm -hmm. That also was launched around the same time of COVID as a recovery measure. But above everything all, we have also as a government, because you see when it comes to uh, business, you first of all need to be so sure about uh, sustainable 
or rather access to sustainable market. Mm. So then what have we been doing in that space? Yes. We've had engagement, of course, with uh, um, the, glob the global um, uh, market. Mm. We early um, this year, we were able to conclude uh, an economic partnership between us and the mm -hmm. European Union, mm -hmm. expanding the market for MSMEs, especially those who are doing uh, manufacturing and especially for export. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that in itself is a part of the recovery measure because part of the recovery measure also we have to create more linkages to uh, for the, the our MSME to access the market. Mm -hmm. And on the financing bit, I know the challenges have been there, but what are we doing also in the space of MSME? We've been able to introduce, especially when we came in mm -hmm. uh, as a government, um, a financial inclusion uh, intervention through the Hustler Fund. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, many people look at the Hustler Fund and uh, the logic behind Hustler Fund, probably which some people do not understand, yes. is that this is also part of recovery. Mm -hmm. Because if we are rehabilitating majority of Kenyans, we found almost 8 million Kenya who had gone, who you know, who had sunk into CRBs. Mm -hmm. And you see, one, once you sunk into CRBs, means that you've been uh, blocked, you know, from mm -hmm. participating effectively in the economy. So what did we need to do? as a government and uh, we had to find a way of helping uh, these Kenyans who most of them actually were running their own small, small businesses recover from those shocks, repair their credit. So that's how then we came up with this fund, the Hustler Fund, and we agreed. We had a conversation with the private sector, the financial institution, and all other players in the economy that there is a way through which we can all come together and partner and give a second life to majority of these Kenyans. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're talking about Kenyans who are aged 18 years and uh, above who are in their productive, you know, age, productive timelines. Mm -hmm. And you see, if you lock them out of the economy, the threat in the market, or rather the failure in the market will be like, even for the financial uh, market, financial institution, the customer base was also bound to decrease. So if we encourage that to happen like each and every year without any strategy to supporting them to come out of, you know, uh, to, to come out of that hole. Mm -hmm. What will happen then is that even the private sector will wake up one day and they find they have no customer to work with. Mm -hmm. So it was to benefit all of us in the market. So for us to correct that market failure. So we introduced the Hustler Fund okay. to deepen financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. I know we started off with the lower limits. Uh, the max was about 3,000. Mm -hmm. So far it has actually increased. And today as we speak, following, uh, you know, the increase uh, during a first anniversary, yes. we have Kenyans actually who can even borrow up to 50,000 mm -hmm. who have been growing the, their, their limit, mm. depending on how, you know, the practice of just borrowing and they have shown they have very good mm -hmm. credit borrowing mm -hmm. behavior. And so why were we doing this? Mm. It's because the moment you meet some shocks, even if you had some sort of collateral, you know, and you go down, mm -hmm. you know, coming up becomes a challenge because probably you do not have security. And how do you de-risk them? We de-risk them by trying also now to introduce a new form of collateral. And in this sense, we can actually build your collateral or your credit access by just building good behaviors because each one of us can take care of their behavior and can grow good mannerism around credit. Mm -hmm. But then we also sat down with the private sector, especially the financial institution, and we say, look, majority of our population, they are, they are unbanked, mm -hmm. they are unserved, they don't own property, you know, they, they, some of them, actually majority of them are not employed. Because look at, this country has a potential workforce of 20 million. Yes. Out of 20 million, only 3.5 million are employed mm -hmm. formally, okay. like formally employed, either in private sector or in civil service. Mm -hmm. And out of 3.5 million, the civil service can only take, actually it accounts for less than 1 million, to be precise, yes. around 970,000. Mm -hmm. So leaving 2.5 million or thereabout in the private sector. But then those ones who are not formally employed are about 17 million. So what does it mean? It means that 
those people have to hustle, mm. have to engage informally and create opportunities for themselves and see how they can be able to earn an income. Mm. So the work of the government is to see how do we create a conducive environment? How do we stimulate economic engagement of these 17 million people? How do we formalize them? Because most of them we do not even know. You know, if you are informal, nobody even know where you are. Mm -hmm. So when we come up with intervention, we are not able to come up with specific and targeted intervention that will really help you mm -hmm. and fast track your way up. So what we needed to do is come up with measures that will create visibility of these 17 million. And today, as we speak, mm. just through the Financial Inclusion Fund, we've been able to create a visibility of close to 22.9 million Kenyans. We've reached out to 22.9 million Kenyans. We have a data people who have been onboarded on the Hustler Fund. Out of them, around 20 million have actually borrowed the Hustler Fund. And we've been able to disperse through just the phone, you yourself dialing the phone yeah. and uh, requesting, depending on your credit limit, mm -hmm. about 51.9 million. Billion. Mm -hmm. Out of that, because we also introduced... 59 billion. 51.9 billion uh -huh. that has so far been disbursed. That's our loan portfolio. Okay. And then out of that, there is usually a mandatory saving of 5%, of which 70% goes to the long term the long uh, savings, savings, because you also want to encourage the culture of pension, the culture of saving for the future, so that if you retire, whether in the informal sector, whether in MSME, whether you're employed, mm -hmm. you retire into a decent future you have a decent end because you've had situation where you know even if you're doing a business even if you're a mamamboga mm. time will come when you cannot mm. go to that kibanda mm. so what happens to you we need to start now securing mm. our future mm. so we introduce that platform so 30 percent of your borrowing every time you borrow goes to your short term which you can really you know access after one year and you can be able to invest in any desirable project that you want okay. so by doing that mm. we've been able to mobilize close to three billion in saving where these 22 uh, around uh, 20 million kenyans who have actually borrowed the hustler fund mm. now have got a savings of course uh, of about uh, three billion and these were now and, and let me also just on that mm. You see, like the top hustler fund uh, yeah. uh, borrower yeah. during our first anniversary had saved close to 225,000, mm -hmm. uh, you know, shillings. And this is a person who never even had a single saving. So, with that kind of saving, mm -hmm. if now he moves back and he goes to the bank now to ask for any loan, let's say 200. Thousand or wherever, I'm yeah. sure the commercial bank will give this person one on the basis of now having demonstrated good uh, credit rating mm -hmm. and also having some sort of saving. So we are helping the the hustlers not just to access this money but also to start now saving mm -hmm. as a, as a way of securing, okay. uh, you know, as also. Uh, as a way of um, mobilizing and uh, populating their future collateral. Mm -hmm. And out of that, mm -hmm. we have close to 8 million Kenyans, like, who borrow regularly, who have borrowed more times, mm -hmm. more than even ti 10 times. You realize even the, when during the anniversary there was debate around, how did this, uh, the best borrower borrow close to over 800 times? And it is possible because it depends with the kind of business which you're doing. You can borrow as many times that you need uh, a day, so long as you're borrowing and repaying. But again also, there are people who are being incentivized because of that opportunity of saving. Mm. Because you see, it's not easy to find a, 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 a product or, a, or rather to find a platform where you can save as little as 50 shillings, mm. as little as a hand or even 10 bob. Okay. But here now you have a platform, it's so easy, you don't have to walk to the bank to save, you just borrow, you save. So that some Kenyans were just borrowing multiple times because they wanted to start saving for their future. Yes, what's the cost of starting an MSME in this country? Well, it, it, it depends mm -hmm. because again it also depends with the definition the of definition. your MSME and let me just give you some <coughs> statistics so that you know mm -hmm. is that like I said earlier on that 98% of our businesses are MSME mm -hmm. but then 
out of that 98 percent, you find that almost 88 percent are micro. We're talking about the micro, those ones that are, are highly informal. Mm -hmm. Probably they have only employed uh, uh, that particular person, the, 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 sole, the sole entrepreneur, proprietor. the proprietor, yeah. the person who is running the business probably, or uh, maybe they're in some sort of lottery. Today I get some money, I do business. Tomorrow I'm not doing, you know, it's some sort of lottery mm -hmm. uh, engagement. Today if you give me money, I, you know, I'll go and maybe buy a few things from Kikomba, go sell. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow I'm out of business, some sort of. Mm -hmm. So they are just trying to do something in the hope that they can raise some income to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. So those majority of them are micro. Mm -hmm. They are actually not running businesses that are sustainable, businesses which are informed by a market. So most of them are still in that space. However, uh, the, according to the statistics uh, which we have uh, as per 2016, mm -hmm. now I'm working on those statistics mm -hmm. to update them and hopefully I, I by the end of this, by the end of, yeah, statistics. by the end of this financial year yeah. and, and I think uh, we're already working on uh, survey on MSM. Towards end of June, I think wow. we'll have uh, new, mm. and new and updated statistics about uh, our MSME in this country, which is very, very uh, instrumental mm. even to informing our programs. So uh, you find that, um, so the, the small, so we have MSME which are micro, mm. which may not even be registered. People, you wake up today, you you run, start running battle with the authority because you think I just need to get my goods put it there. You're not licensed, you're not what. Mm. Then as you move towards a, a small, there probably you have acquired a license, an operating license. You're somehow registered, you have a registered name, you know, which are also very, very few. And then from there, and, and you remember that number even increased when we had uh, measures that uh, uh, in, in the last regime, which actually eased uh, you know, the, 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 the entry to business. You remember when they put together one-stop shop for business registration, the Huduma services, that helped and supported many people actually to walk into Huduma Center, register business names and stuff. So somehow, some people, they could be having, uh, you know, a business name that they are, they have registered, which is to business name, about 600 bob you get a business to register a business name but again as you move to us now the medium and even at the apex of the the higher end of the small you have also companies and companies to register you need something probably from between around 20,000 to get everything if you do not know how to do the documentation you need to seek services so the entry cost around there to set up a business I would say especially if I to look at the company probably you need about 50,000 shillings but for a business name which is the easiest you have 600 you can be able to register and you are there in business but for me the cost is not even about registration. The cost is about coming up with viable business ideas which you can easily access the market and again which because if you can access the market then even you'll be trusted in the financing space. So you'll also be able to access credit. Yeah. You, you, um a, a, a huge task, especially for the population Kenyans, have been to move from just being business owners to entrepreneurs. And mm. I'm sure that's, mm. I mean, a key goal, especially for this government. Do you think that as things are moving right now, we are progressing and is there hope to become actually a manufacturing country? Because these are the yeah. strategies that have been used by countries that, you know, we benchmark with. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that as it is right now, there is hope that perhaps say by the end of the first term of this government, we'll have moved from X percentage of manufacturing to a bigger percentage that will then enable Kenyans to say, okay, fine, the hustler fund that I took has enabled me to do manufacturing. I think it, it's very possible, and I'll give you a journey why that is very possible. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, if try to we correct, first of all, the market failure uh -huh. uh, in access to credit. And by doing that is to bringing everybody on the table and letting them just appreciate 
why we are doing this, why it's important for us to all of us to commit to financial inclusion. And the commitment to financial inclusion yes. is by making sure that you come up with the finance, financing products mm -hmm. which are easily accessible and uh, we also now looking going the digital way because mm. through digitalization then you get to cut down on the cost of uh, uh, on the some cost of operation mm -hmm. a cost of administration mm. of that particular credit because that then what makes our credit to become very expensive yes. so if we can bring down the barrier and enable our MSMEs who have very good ideas mm you know, to access financing. That's one pathway mm -hmm. of heating manufacturing. I know currently our percentage is very low. Mm -hmm. Our manufacturing sector, we almost between seven to 8%. Mm -hmm. But our aspiration to see to how can we move this to about 20% uh, um, or more, mm -hmm. probably by 2030. So if that is our aspiration, where do we begin from? We first of all begin by appreciating the architecture and the outlook of the economy. Mm -hmm. We are micro, so first of all, we must come up with a, a micro, a micro, a, you know, best manufacturing strategy. Mm -hmm. And how do we achieve this? You saw, uh, we, we launched the county aggregation and industrial park, uh, you know, across the country. Yes. And uh, I know so far we've done, we've done groundbreaking of about uh, 12 of them mm -hmm. and we're still moving on I, I'm sure this year we are going to do more groundbreaking and the reason we are doing this is that our manufacturing strategy which is now based around certain priority value chain for example we we flagged out nine priority value chains we are looking at dairy well, we're looking at livestock leather value chain these have got a very high growth potential mm -hmm. and which can boost our manufacturing. We're looking at edible oil. Remember, edible oil is our second import bill mm -hmm. in this country oh. after petroleum. Mm -hmm. And yet the raw materials for edible oil, those are our traditional food value chain, mm -hmm. the sesame, I mean the sunflowers, mm -hmm. the, you know, the palm oil, all these things. Our people have got that practice to do. It. It's just a question, how do we arrange our small scale farmers mm. to now start venturing into that. How do we make sure that the cost of input comes down and becomes affordable, like the fertilizer? How do we make sure that there is availability of uh, quality seeds mm. to support them and to, and to, to enhance the, pro, the production? Because once you have the production level of raw materials, mm -hmm. then what happens is that you can now drive the value addition mm -hmm. and value addition is manufacturing mm -hmm. and you can be able now to attract investors including those foreign investors to come now and invest mm -hmm. so the whole um, idea of setting up this county aggregation and industrial park mm -hmm. is to first of all provide a market for our farmers and mm -hmm. so uh, and also stimulate local investment mm -hmm. in those counties so that now people start moving towards value addition and uh, like i say for us to make value, to add value to our farming, we have to go the direction of manufacturing, yeah. adding value, because that's what will give us that competitiveness that can create jobs. Mm. So we are on the right track in terms of uh, in terms of our thinking, mm. in terms of having identified those priority value chain. Mm. And again, we are looking also at coffee, tea, our traditional cash crop, and mm. see how do we add value, how do we go the value addition way. Okay. So we have a commitment to that. Mm. But also by setting up those infrastructure and, and in, in our industrialization strategy mm. is to show uh, our population that there is no corner of this country which cannot manufacture. Mm. Because each and, the, each and every corner of this country, they have some value proposition in terms of uh, uh, certain value chains, be it agricultural. Mm -hmm. You've seen right now we are working, uh, we, we are heavily promoting mm -hmm. the building and construction, the affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing this? This is also to stimulate now the manufacturing of the local raw materials to support that sector. And yeah. we are doing this across the country. Yes, you've, I'm sure you've seen the concerns, especially regarding the um, farmers, milk farmers, um, avocado farmers as well, yeah. regarding the taxes that came about with, this, with the Finance Act of 2023. Mm -hmm. Looking at, you know, the the positive outlook that you're giving, don't you think that perhaps in a way also that these um, incentives or these initiatives that the government has come with, 
could be in hindsight be you know reducing the confidence of someone saying i can venture you know because we are looking at the small uh, mm. if i have say a quarter of an acre of of, 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 of avocado mm. uh, trees mm. i'll be able to you know venture into it and see mm. how it will go mm. about don't you think that perhaps in a way the same government just continues to demoralize if you could call it i, I don't think um that's the case yeah. uh, number one you've seen let me give you an example of um, the petrol yeah, okay the prices of petrol, yeah. when we came in, where were we? And it wasn't because of our own internal factors, it was global factors, mm. the high inflation and everything. We've been able to work that out. And just uh, uh, last week, you saw now even coming down to 10 shillings. Mm. And I think now the prices are going to come down. You saw when we came, where did we find the dollar? So when you see, uh, uh, things happening, especially impacting on our taxes, sometimes mm -hmm. they're not just internal uh, mm -hmm. factors. But we are trying as a government, and, uh, and I want to assure you, given that the, we are managing the high inflation, mm -hmm. the shilling is gaining strength against the dollar. I think this is going also to be cascaded even to our, our, our tax regime. Mm -hmm. And again, our taxation in this country are not static. Mm -hmm. This is a government that is in, we are engaging. We are engaging because we know our MSMEs and the Kenyan people are our partners mm -hmm. in our economic development agenda. We feel the heat, but we say we can take this pain for some time as we work out a conducive environment. I, I am also sure that uh, you saw the other day a treasury promising that they're really looking into our tax regime. Mm -hmm. They're taking a look around it and see but the most uh, 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 the most important thing that needs to happen is building the visibility mm -hmm. now uh, before you know who are even these farmers and i think uh, we've been working on registering the farmers Through digital it is, which has which has cost chaos because I no mean, it might have cost chaos <laughs> I, I mean people will feel this is really causing chaos and doing this but you know it also giving us an appreciation of what these farmers what are their needs mm. what are their pain points what are their challenges but isn't it and make us also them? to address mm. it. Is it wouldn't that be mapping them up to so perhaps you know go uh, go ahead and tax them because I don't, that, uh, you that know, has been the but concern. you see yeah. taxation is our civic responsibility, responsibility. if i might say yeah. because we need a better environment a better business environment we must also pay for it. pay for it and where does the government generate revenue it generates revenue from the taxes so but what uh, we are doing is as we now uh, embark on you know uh, working out the environment, we need to know who are they. Remember, just the other day uh, when, we, uh, when His Excellency the President announced subsidies around fertilizers, mm. it was going to be very difficult had we not registered those farmers and actually make sure that we break off the middlemen who middlemen and probably let me be sensitive and say middle women mm -hmm. who are <laughs> you know making the cost of yeah. fertilizer also go up. go up because now it becomes so easy a voucher system you get a message because you have registered yourself given your details you know where you are you've, you've indicated mm -hmm. the number of acreages that you have and you can now tell the quantities that you need so that to avoid a situation where middlemen will go and buy those subsidized fertilizers go and hoard and now start reaching out to those farmers probably who do not have information. Mm -hmm. I think this digitalization and registering our farmers and especially around specific value chain is going to help us to understand them more. Mm. If we know we are dealing with two million farmers, for example, of mm. coffee, or if there are even two million of avocado who are there, we know which part of this country is there. Mm -hmm. We know the, the, the context. We know even the, the climate condition in mm -hmm. that particular uh, part of the country. We know which kind of support probably mm -hmm. they need. It will help us now to come up with intervention and incentives, tax incentives, that now will ease their burden because now it will be specific to, to, to their situation. And I just want to assure Kenyans mm -hmm. that, you see, there is no government that is always deliberate at punishing its people. The government is there for the people and especially for the sector, for the business sector. The government's role is to facilitate the growth of the business sector. I just gave you 
numbers around our job situation, situation in this country and they told you the only room we have to create jobs is in the private sector, sector yeah. so actually it is in our best interest that the, we can stimulate growth in the private sector to enable them create more jobs to our economy mm. and uh, like I said, visibility is very important because then it helps us to come up with targeted and specific intervention mm. to those uh, to, to our farmers and to MSME. And okay, so uh, looking at you know the turnover tax that was increased from one percent to three percent for applicable to MSMEs, if their business turnover is between one million to two twenty-five million, mm. what exactly informed that? Yeah, we of course uh, any any increase, yeah. uh, you know. Any policy that we come about with is informed by, is informed by data, is informed by evidence, and uh, uh, they of course they look at the environment, the performance of the the macro uh, the macroeconomic environment. Yes. They also look at the micro environment. Uh -huh. They also assess opportunities that we have, and they know that. Uh, we can we are able mm. <laughs> to. I know it could be a little bit a. Uh, Pain a little bit, but they know we can actually sustain that mm -hmm. as we we improve uh, our environment. And let me tell you, once we get to improve our environment, we get to create more jobs. We widen the tax base. Mm -hmm. We get to generate more revenue. We get to increase the foreign exchange, mm -hmm. and our shilling start getting much more stronger and stronger than the dollar. Mm. Obviously, we sit back and we'll be able to rationalize mm. and we'll be able to reduce. Okay. Yeah. So when you look at, you know, some of the uh, the wage bill, especially, I mean, when you, when you look at the conversation on wage bill and exporting labor, do you think that perhaps um, the Kenyan youth who constitute a huge percentage of our population mm. are quite interested in taking up entrepreneurship as a venture and means of survival. Because um, on the other side, while Hustler Fund will be able to you know, start you off, say at 3,000, mm. uh, by the time you're increasing, mm. it will also take time. It will also mean that your business idea mm. needs mm. to uh, be viable enough so that you also, as you're talking about manufacturing earlier on, mm. so that you don't just be a business person, you become an entrepreneur. Do you think that perhaps the timeline and the circumstances as they are right now, especially for young people with the high unemployment rates, they are, they are you know, interested in pursuing entrepreneurship and taking up MSMEs. Entrepreneurship actually is a self-employment opportunity, okay. you know? And uh, um, like I said, the biggest problem we have in this economy, in Kenya and across the continent is unemployment. Mm. And I also dare say that the average age of an African uh, person, you know, African citizen in the continent is around 17 years. Who, where is a 17 years? Still in school. school. Okay? So we have a, a problem on how do we make use of the youth bulge. Mm -hmm. So there's so many things that needs to be done. I, I, one, from even our training. Now that uh, uh, you see like the outlook which I've shared, yes, we yes. only have a room for about currently of about 3.5 million Kenyans. Mm. Where do we take 17 million Kenyans? So we need to work also on uh, our training uh, mm. and capacity building a framework so that we start channeling out skills mm. that can quickly be enterprise. Okay. So when you are graduating, we start now also making you understand that you need to be mainstream in the job creation environment. Mm -hmm. That actually, as you walk out of college, as you walk out of the university with mm -hmm. a degree certificate, addition to that, we need to empower you mm -hmm. with tools of now going outside there and creating your own job. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing in my sector, other than Hustler Fund, and by the way, it's not only Hustler Fund, mm -hmm. which is there in this sector. But also there is so much in commercial banks have uh, no but uh, yeah. no before you even go to the commercial bank yeah. within my own state department for example mm -hmm. we have agencies and and within the ecosystem of msme look we have the youth enterprise fund mm -hmm. today young people can be able to borrow even for lpo if they get tender they can borrow even up to 5 million yes. for lpo 
we have Kenya Industrial Estate, which is supporting young people interested in the manufacturing mm -hmm. sector. Uh, Those uh, MSM what's, who are doing oh, what's the rate of you know young people getting these standards, especially from government? Are they at um, you and, know? As because to avoid also this thing of uh, are they, yeah. uh, what's the rate of young people, I mean, in the normal age group, mm -hmm. getting tenders, good tenders, yeah. you're talking about, say, uh, from 5 million and above? There is opportunity for that. Remember, um, for close to now, more than actually almost, uh, um, I'll put it almost two decades mm -hmm. now, when the government uh, started uh, mm. the, this preferential procurement, you know, procurement uh, treatment mm. towards certain disadvantaged group. Mm. Remember during uh, President Kibaki's time, mm. it was about 10% mm -hmm. of access to uh, uh, procurement, government procurement opportunity to young people. Mm. Then when the Uhuru uh, came in uh, 10 years ago, and uh, now probably 11 years ago, mm. they scaled it up to about 30% for youth, women, and persons with disability. Mm. Yes, we have come. If you look at the compliance report across all our MDAs, because you are now talking about government, you'll find that indeed young people mm. have been accessing. Access, yeah. But also because of lack of visibility, which I was talking about, about earlier. Mm. Out earlier, because what do we use Okay. To, to, you know, what is the indicator? The indicator, of course, is the AGPO certificate. Ah, and you see, yeah. I, can re I can have the AGPO certificate, the, the female, mm. you know, the women, and, uh, you know, the youth. The youth, yes. But you see, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. if you've been given tender, what uh -huh. will be recorded there will be okay. like, okay, this number of company mm. that are owned by youth on paper, on paper. we may not know if mm. they were really youth who okay. eventually mm -hmm. benefited or if they are women. But now that's what we are correcting. Okay. Because part of my mandate is Let's, to enforce uh -huh. AGPO and to ensure that yes. indeed we follow up and it's young people, mm -hmm. the young, young people, it is women, mm. it is persons of disability Beauty. who are the end beneficiaries. So if you can hold on that thought, we listen mm. to uh, a caller, some feedback coming in through our calling line. Habib calling in from Nairobi. Good evening, Habib. How are you? Do you have a question to the PS? I'm quite well, thank you. I beg your pardon? I'm saying I'm quite well, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, my question is, uh, the lady has done very well in various issues about uh, borrowing for, for young people to borrow and the personal fund. Yes. But uh, there is a problem with these young men and women who have been trying to trade. Mm -hmm. and They have already registered with Yago, mm -hmm. young people from 20 years to 30 years. Mm -hmm. But then there is a lot of pending bills for them. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this because I've, I've given many of them some money to go and do some business, but they are unable even to pay. They have closed their businesses because of pending bills. Mm -hmm. I'm asking, how do she help these young men and women mm -hmm. to be paid their pending bills, either from the government and from the counties? That is a, that is a bottleneck for them. Uh -huh. And many of them are not trading now, as we speak. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much, Habib, for your question. I'm sure Piers will be able to answer that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, so... Just like we were discussing, yeah. uh, and you were telling me whether young people are willing to do this, mm. I agree with Habib, mm. is that the question of pending bill has been a challenge, yes. a big challenge. But we'll also appreciate what the government is doing right now. Mm. As you're all aware, there is a, a task force headed by the former Auditor General, mm. Edward Uko, yeah. which is looking into that, trying to require those pending bills and to ensure that they get sorted out as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. But also going forward, we're also making a case for AGPO. Part of enforcing of AGPO mm. is for us to ensure that we come out with a, an agreed uh, credit period. Mm -hmm. You know, Let's say if it is six, uh, 60 days, or 90 days max, mm -hmm. because you see, if we are going to advance credit to these young people, assuming they're going to borrow the Hustler Fund or yeah. the Youth Fund or the Kenya Industrial Estate Loan to mm -hmm. put into the tender, 
and uh, they have a grace period of about 60 days mm -hmm. before they start repayment of that credit facility yeah. but then they have done their supplies and what you're doing is that you're not paying them on time mm -hmm. you're actually sinking them deeper into, into poverty and sometimes you're sinking them into the grave because yeah. we've had stories of our uh, entrepreneurs especially young mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. some of them who have resorted to come to suicide mm -hmm. because you see they cannot stand the shame that comes with you know being followed up and down mm -hmm. because of you know having some unrepaid loans here and there but what so those is part of enforcement so we are working mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. and they can assure you is that um, from where I sit as an accounting officer we've been reminded mm -hmm. and you're being reminded like for example in this financial year the government has made it clear and keeps on communicating and reminding from time to time with circular. First of all, we must make sure there is zero a fault audit. Mm -hmm. And part of that is that we do not have some resolve also mm -hmm. pending bills. So we are really working on that. I'm sure and, we'll, and, and, and let me tell you one, how do you do that? Yeah. You do that by ensuring that you can only procure First of all, when you have mm -hmm. the budget, the if budget. you budgeted for, okay. it should not come as something that you just thought of, you'll procure and then you budget. You can only procure when there is a budget. So there is that, uh, uh, the budgetary discipline that uh, has been instilled in us. And I think uh, from, uh, from last financial year when we came in, mm -hmm. this financial year and the coming years, I want to assure Kenyans that this question of pending bills is also is going to be an issue of so we are, we are really we are, working on it. We are looking at um, you know the yes there are a lot of reforms around that space. Now, now I'm saying uh -huh. in the in the coming years yes. we are going to resolve this, okay. and uh, we are all waiting for the report from the uh, the 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 task force mm -hmm. that is working on it so that also to look at what are these pending bills. Mm -hmm. There are some which are not genuine and mm -hmm. of course we know. Because there are it, some which are genuine is, so we try to yeah. isolate them. The, the, yeah. the other thing would be, I mean young people do not go borrowing I think about up to 20 million. Is there a way of expediting and saying okay these small amounts this, you know, that Habib was talking about, these young people who are trading, I'm sure it's not maxes of 10 million or thereabouts to be able to expedite so that they are able to you know repay and still borrow so that then the credit score is also not that part of the reason why hustler fund is there mm. is actually to give these young people an opportunity to access higher L listen you amount. know l let me tell you if mm. you can be trusted with 500 yes 500 shillings you can also be trusted with 10 million okay because it means you are borrowing for a reason. Mm -hmm. And then Hustler Fund gives you now that credit rating. From there, you get graduated mm -hmm. to other uh, financing opportunities. Like mm -hmm. now, within even the government space, I've said we have Youth Enterprise Fund, mm -hmm. which now uh, it, it, it's doing LPO financing okay. among the young people. Mm -hmm. So now, if you have uh, emerged from the Hustler Fund, this personal loan, you're borrowing 500 shillings, blah, blah, and you're paying well. We just that credit scoring. If we can trust it, mm. you can actually now go to Youth Enterprise Fund mm. on the basis of that okay. and borrow for LPO financing. Brilliant. Then, of course, we're also working on market guarantee. Oh. We want to make sure, and market guarantee also comes with how prompt do you pay, mm. you know. So the county governments, the, the MDS, yeah. we're all having this conversation. Because mm. even for the county governments, these young people do not just belong to the national government. Mm. They belong to, to even to the county governments. Mm. They are Kenyans. And even in the private sector, the pending bills are not just in government. They are also rife in the private sector. private sector. So we're also having that conversation mm -hmm. to ensure that the only way that we can encourage young people to take up entrepreneurship opportunity mm -hmm. is when they are guaranteed with a market. Mm -hmm. And for them to be guaranteed with a market, mm -hmm. the prompt payment is a factor. Ah. And then also secondly, it's just a question of so information sharing. Mm -hmm. How do we share information okay. about opportunities which are there? So we are really enforcing that. So for us in our, our sector, in our state department, for us, we've come up with indicators. It is not about how many, you know, like um, how many, uh, I mean, youth owned uh, mm -hmm. AGPO, uh, yeah, you know, yes. certificate yeah. did you consider? We actually want to see those young people. We're also doing M&D mm -hmm. to look at how many of these, uh, how did that help you? Okay. If you borrowed, uh, you know, 
for for help your financing. Mm. Where are you today? Right. Where is your business today? Are okay. you growing? And also, let me just also correct you that we have many young people in the manufacturing sector, by the way. Okay. I know a number of young people this year alone that they have come to me. We have had a conversation. They have very brilliant, brilliant ideas. Some are doing a value addition, and we've been able to link them up to Kenya Industrial Estate. Yeah. Some of them are now accessing 5 million, they're accessing 10 million. Uh -huh. You know, against their business, the business uh, okay. ideas. And, and, and you know, there is huge opportunity. But of course, I talked about 70%. I know we can do more. Yes, let's, um, we've entered the home stretch of the conversation and yeah. I want us to go to feedback. I'm seeing through our SMS line. Um, you don't see your number, but you, you give your name, but you say, I don't get my hustler fund. Why? I need it. Someone is asking that. Do the... What do you mean you don't get? Has he repaid? <laughs> Perhaps you'll answer that for us. Um, yeah. Someone says, I have a creativity of creating content uh, of an episode, but I can't raise it. I would like to have support. Um, I think this is in terms of content creation. In content, if at all we are financing that, uh -huh. if the gentleman, I don't know if he's a gentleman or a lady, if yeah. they walk into youth enterprise fund, enterprise fund. there is an opportunity for that okay. if they are youth. Okay. Okay. If the women, if they walk into women enterprise fund, mm -hmm. they are products that they can be supported. Mm -hmm. And because it's content, I think the youth and the Weso Fund is also there okay. within that space. They can, if they come together, cluster together as mm -hmm. a team, they can be able to be facilitated up to, let's say, half a, half a million. Mm -hmm. Like I say, KIE can support them up to 20 million. Uh -huh. But we want also to expand that, to push KIE to the now space of crowding MSMEs into the manufacturing by giving them higher loans. Then also in the manufacturing, we have an opportunity. We have this government credit guarantee scheme, which we are now working out, especially to support MSMEs who are doing expo, who require high, you know, high, high loan limits. And uh, uh, so we can guarantee them. We can guarantee their business. Uh -huh. And also as a part of also the risking also, uh -huh. the financing sector. So okay. there is opportunity. Uh -huh. What I will say is that uh, with the coming of the State Department, it's now very easy to place your hands and mm -hmm. your eyes mm -hmm. on those opportunities. Because before, uh, it was basically just yeah, yeah. private sector, mm -hmm. or people working so, in silos. Yeah. Now you can really, if you come to our office, mm -hmm. we can be able to guide you even uh -huh. to opportunities in the private sector. Brilliant. If we could just, we have just about max of a minute, but uh, there is a report you talked about. Mm. Um, tracking MSME scorecard, is that report available to informers working mm. with women-led smallholder cotton farmers? Yes or no? There's a report you mentioned about earlier that is available. The credit score? That, yeah, the trading score. Is it available for women-led smallholder cotton farmers to access it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We have women who have been digitalized. All right. Our presidential economic team working mm. together with the MDS in government, we've been able, we've digitalized farmers. We have specific farmers who are doing cotton, mm -hmm. our farmers who are doing sunflower. So we've been able to register farmers mm -hmm. as per those uh, sectors across the country. Mm -hmm. So those value chain. So it's easier. Mm -hmm. It depends from where he come from. If it's in Rift Valley, Western part of this country, we can be able to avail the data and it becomes easier. For, for them now to engage in support. Okay, the last one. Uh, no, the problem of supporting the development of SMEs is not finance or access to credit, mm. as some s seem to think. The key mm. is skills acquisition. Yes. Um, finance is the last thing we need to think about after the market, interest or attitude and mm -hmm. skills mm. and attitude that self-employment is a viable option. Many believe they can set up businesses but that is not for them. It is for those without education as a stopgap measure mm. as they await an opening in salaried job. Even parents prefer the youth to seek salaried mm. employment. This person is also asking, can the mm. peers leave contacts to be able to... Yeah, of course guys? you can share my contact uh -huh. because I'm here for them and uh -huh. to create necessary linkages. And I agree with him. Yes. It's about uh, an, an attitude. Mm -hmm. We have to change our attitude about it. Mm -hmm. And we just have to accept reality that if there are going to be jobs, it is us, Kenyans, uh -huh. to create those jobs. So, and yes. there are massive opportunities mm -hmm. on also training. Let me just also share yeah. with this person probably could be running some initiative mm -hmm. that uh, we, we have acquired close to 3 billion through our, uh, you know, 
uh, support facility from the German government, mm -hmm. which is aimed at training young people in terms of upgrading their skill mm -hmm. uh, and also upskilling them mm -hmm. to be able to do viable business, but also to be able to do some jobs. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can also, also, we need to look at the, the service in trade. You can also actually enterprise services. For example, the affordable housing. Mm -hmm. You can pull together, cluster together a group mm -hmm. of young people from TVETs who are plumbers. They come together and they get subcontracted. That's mm -hmm. also entrepreneurship. Brilliant. P.S. Um, if you 20 seconds to give Kenyans your parting shot, especially on the future. I would say the future is very bright. Okay. The government is committed to creating an enabling environment, mm -hmm. to growing and scaling up our MSMEs because Obviously, as it sits right now, mm -hmm. if we have to create jobs, we have to focus more resources, more attention, and we have to get everybody to support MSME to start, you know, seeing or mm -hmm. experiencing some growth. And I will say here that one of the challenges which we've had is that we have a heavy bottom. I mean, we have a heavy micro mm. in MSME. The first aim is, is, is large and it's heavy. Mm. So we are now focusing on the micro and to see how we start now scaling them up to small to medium and eventually to large enterprises at the point where we will now be growing a manufacturing sector, mm. creating more secure and sustainable jobs. Okay. So we are on course. Habib is saying, just allow me that when a director, he <laughs> says, why then not translate pending bills into receivables, which can then enable the young men and women borrow with receivables money owed by counties and government? That is also uh, one of the considerations. Oh. Like I said, the task force, uh -huh is working on a number of uh, initiatives, options, options and, and one of them, mm -hmm. of course, that's one of the oh. options. But again, we will be open. I think once they come up with the, their report, yes. and uh, we will subject this also to public participation. Okay. And I think Habib uh, is still welcome to welcome. my office, so, because that's really a very uh, brilliant suggestion. suggestion. We want to do that. Okay. But there is opportunities for the young people, mm. and Kenya is very young uh -huh. and therefore if it has to happen in business it mm. has to be about the young people okay. both um, men and women Amen. Yeah. brilliant madam susan mangeni principal yeah. secretary in uh, the state department for micro small and medium enterprises msme development thank you so much for making time thank for you us. george and make sure you also do a side hustle uh, of course Start I will. By hustle of fund. Uh, of course i will and of course i'll be coming to you for financing of the with the options that we've talked about in government absolutely and it's great yeah. to see you back on your feet especially after that accident you're doing better now I'm glad. Brilliant. And I'm uh, grateful to God. Uh -huh. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much for making time for us. Sandy. And we look forward to having this conversation, yeah. especially after the outcome of the pending bills report mm. and, you know, the other issues mm. that you're talking about and accessibility yeah. to funds. Thank you. And we'll come here anytime you call upon us Asante. now to work out our strategy mm. for job creation. Job creation. We, I really wish to discuss that with uh -huh. you so that we start creating these jobs yes. with you. <laughs> Brilliant. We shall be able to do that. And thank you so much, Madam P.S. Yeah. Susan Mangeni, for your time. My name is George Mar Ringa, thanking you so much for your time and feedback. I was, of course, on the show uh, next week. Hibak Said will be back to take and to steer the cause on the marketplace. It has been a pleasure holding the foot. As always, stay safe and be kind to another. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you for